Another thing that was bothering physicists and scientists in general had to do with what's known as the atomic spectrum or atomic spectra. This is an image of the spectra of light from the sun. You know, you use like a prism and you spread the light out from the sun. If you can spread it out wide enough, maybe use a diffraction rating, you're able to see that there's actually dark lines. There's lines that the sun does not emit at. Or another way of saying that is that there's stuff in the sun that is absorbing at those wavelengths, such that the light that's created inside the sun is not able to actually get out because there's stuff that's absorbing it. So if you think about this process of absorption of light or versus emission of light, we can understand those pretty easily by looking at these two setups. In A, we're showing what absorption of light might look like and what the spectrum might look like. Start out with white light, right? white light that's the full spectrum from red to violet. You send that white light through a gas, and then the light that passes through that gas, you spread out with this prism. Goes through the prism, right? we have this refraction, spreads out, and then if you have a screen there, you can see the full spectrum of light that came through, and some of those wavelengths of light are actually absorbed by the gas. So that's why you will get these dark lines. These are all the wavelengths that did not make it through the gas. We call them absorption lines. That is as opposed to emission of light. You take a gas and you pretty much just dump a bunch of electromagnetic energy into that gas, and then that energy is released from the gas as light. And we can take that light then and again use a prism to spread it out. And if you spread it out, you see that it's actually only made up of certain bands, certain wavelengths. So these are the wavelengths that that gas emitted. We call these the emission lines. It was just sort of puzzling that this was a thing at all. Why are these gases have these particular absorption or emission spectrums? People knew that they were there. They came up with pretty elaborate formulas to quantify where they were and how you could put in numbers to them. But there was no physical understanding, no model for why it was the way it was. These are some examples of particular emission spectros for hydrogen and uh, for iron. So remember, this is like you have like a gas of hydrogen and you dump a bunch of electromagnetic energy into it, basically put it into a circuit with a very large potential difference across it, and you'll get light emitting out from that gas, that hydrogen gas. Spread out that light with a prism or diffraction grating. You can see that that light is actually only made up of a couple different wavelengths. Well, depending on your resolution. At one resolution, about three or four different wavelengths. There's actually two in that purple area. One of them is very difficult. Pretty simple though, only a couple of ones. Intuitively it makes sense, you might know that hydrogen is the simplest element that we that there is, just a proton or an electron. So its emission spectra turns out to be simple. Iron, I don't even recall the atomic number of iron, but it's a more complicated element. Its emission spectrum turns out to also be much more complicated. So again, in the sort of late 19th century, early 20th century, People have been studying this spectrum, this emission spectrum of hydrogen. It's a pretty simple thing, so maybe you can figure out a formula to fit to this data, essentially. And people did. The first one was called the Balmer formula, and it looked like this, and it fit to those few lines. I guess there's a couple more in that spectrum. It's hard to see this, some of them are very dim. But basically you could get out the wavelength of any of those lines by just putting in the number of the line. This formula will give you the wavelength of those lines. That worked just fine for the emission lines that were known about, but pretty soon after, there were new lines discovered in hydrogen's spectrum, emission spectrum. Like I said, you can, depending on your resolution, you can see there's actually more lines in that hydrogen spectrum. So there, people started being able to spread that spectrum out even more and you actually see that there are other sets of emission lines in the hydrogen spectrum. So then, apparently this person named Rydberg came up with a slightly different version of this formula that could explain those lines. So it didn't just have this 2 squared, it had two different integer values that were changeable, and essentially you just start out at one set, or the beginning of one set of those spectral lines, and this formula gives you the other ones. And there were multiple sets of these lines. There's names for them. They call them like the Lyman series and the Balmer series and most different stuff. 
I mean, these formulas worked, but again, it's like you have data and you're fitting a curve to that data, but you have no idea why that curve fits, or there's no explanation for why you're using the equation that you are to fit to that data. What was needed in order to answer that why question was a model of the hydrogen atom. And there actually were models. One of those earlier models was known as the Thompson model, also sometimes called the plum pudding model, because it essentially postulated that the atom was like this positively charged stuff, and there were little, tiny little negative dots just kind of strewn about inside. So Thompson was actually the guy that found experimental evidence was given credit for discovering the electron, the existence of the electron. So he knew that the electron was this negatively charged thing, and he knew there was this very tiny little thing, and so this was the model he came up with. And overall, an atom is generally neutrally charged, so we also know that there had to be positive charge in that atom as well. You know, pretty reasonable model you come up with. It's just this kind of positive pudding, spherical pudding, with a bunch of negatively charged plums in there. I don't know the timeline exactly, but I think it, the next sort of evolution of our, this model of the atom was that, yeah, there's these tiny little negative things floating around in the atom, but the positive stuff is actually all condensed into this small little portion in the center of the atom. This idea for the Rutherford model, I think, actually came out of the results of this experiment by Geiger and Marsden. This is like a top-down view of the experiment where you have this source of radiation, alpha radiation. That's a source of uh, basically particles that can shoot out. So you have this source, and they have this piece of uh, gold, very thin gold, so gold foil. And they're basically just shooting these particles at the gold foil. So the particles that they were shooting, they knew were what they called alpha particles. They didn't know at the time, but it turns out those are actually helium nuclei. They did know enough to know that they were um, positively charged, and they were much, much larger than the electrons that Thompson had discovered, something like almost 10,000 times larger than the electrons. So regardless of the model that you think is correct, these alpha particles are not going to be affected by the electrons in either of these pictures. It's like rolling a bowling ball and there's like a piece of dust in here. The dust doesn't affect the roll of the bowling ball. It's going to keep going straight. That is to say that in Thompson's model, where you have just this kind of like positive and charged stuff, you wouldn't expect it to deflect any of these alpha particles. So the alpha particles are just going to kind of cruise through that stuff. The electrons aren't going to affect them at all. So with Thompson's model, you would expect that the alpha particles are mostly just going to land straight on the other side of the gold foil, pretty much just go through. However, this experiment, you know, they had this circular screen all the way around this gold foil so they could see things that were coming off at all angles. And what they in fact found was that some of these alpha particles were being scattered at these really large angles. This is not what you would expect from Thompson's model. So I believe this is probably where Rutherford decided, well, if most of the atom is kind of empty space and the positively charged portion of the atom is just like very small, dense thing in the center of the atom, then you could get this result where most of those alpha particles are just going to keep going through, right? Because most of the atom is empty, but some of them will hit that center that is much more massive than the electrons, enough that it's going to scatter these alpha particles. So that's where we get from Thompson's model, saying that's probably not right, to the Rutherford model. The Rutherford model is better for sure, but not still not really great. It's just kind of this positive chunk in the middle, really tiny little negative thing just kind of floating around. Wasn't able to tell us anything about the atomic spectra or why the atomic spectra is the way it is. So then comes along this guy, Bohr, Niels Bohr, with his own postulates, being, having to do with uh, the hydrogen atom, and atoms in general, but most of it, what we're going to talk about is the hydrogen atom. Now this was apparently about 1913, he published these postulates, which basically just takes this quantization idea and applies it to the electrons orbiting or moving around in an atom. The first postulate says that these electrons are actually orbiting the center of the atom, in a heavy, positively charged center, the electrons are orbiting in stationary or like stable, discrete circular orbits. So discrete meaning that like in this picture, 
there's this orbit where n is equal to 1, and then there's this orbit where n is equal to 2. There's nothing in between. This is what I mean by discrete. It's not a continuous uh, spectrum here, not a continuous change. The second postulate was about the angular momentum then of the electrons, and it sort of follows that if the orbits are discrete, then the angular momentum that any electron is going to have in the atom is also discrete. Because angular momentum is, for a circular motion, is pretty straightforward. It's just the momentum times the radius that that object is spinning around. So if the orbits are discrete, the radii that they're going to be orbiting at is discrete, meaning that the angular momentum of those electrons is going to also be discrete. So you could write it down as, say, n times h bar. Remember, h bar is just h, Planck's constant, divided by 2 pi. So this is just saying the angular momentum of these electrons is some multiple of h bar. And then finally, the third postulate, again, if you say these orbits are discrete, then the energy difference between these orbits is also discrete. So when an electron is orbiting in, in one of these orbits, and it's going to absorb some energy, there needs to be a very specific amount of energy that it can absorb in order to go from one orbit to the next, right? Because there's no sort of wiggle room, right? It's either n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 1, n equals 3. There's no in-between. And since there's no in-between, it also means these transitions need to happen instantaneously. The electron is in one, absorbs energy, instantly is in the second orbit. Here's then a little bit more in-depth look at what Bohr's postulates mean for the model of the atom. So the left side is a static picture that's, you know, just enlarged from the last slide, but now we're sort of giving some more terminology to these orbits. That n equals one orbit, that's the smallest orbit possible here, that's what we call the ground state of this atom. When an electron is in that orbit, it's in its lowest energy state, it's the ground state. Then n equals two, n equals three, those are what we call the excited states of this atom. And then on the right side here, we have this little gif of a photon being emitted or absorbed by an atom. There's this electron, this orbiting atom, say, at the ground state at one second, and then it's going to absorb a photon, right, absorb some energy, and that energy is just the right amount of energy that's between those two orbits, right? So the difference in energy of this orbit to this orbit, or n equals 1, n equals 2, when that energy is just that right amount, that photon can be absorbed, the electron jumps to the other orbit instantaneously. And then if that electron is, say, in that second orbit, or that first excited state, it can emit a photon. It can emit a photon, in fact, only with the exact amount of energy between that first excited state and the ground state. Because there's nowhere else for that electron to go down. But if I didn't know that this little green wavy thing with an arrow is meant to indicate a photon. We can also note that correctly drawn or shown on this GIF is that when the electron is in a larger orbit, it's moving slower. Larger radius, moving slower. Smaller radius, moving faster. Okay, so this is a lot of stuff on this slide, but try not to freak out. Most of the stuff are constants. You just kind of have to keep writing. 4 pi epsilon naught e m e. Those are, these are all just constant values. Okay, if we take Bohr's postulates, in particular that the angular momentum of this electron, or the electron in a hydrogen atom, is quantized, and recalling that these orbits are circular, so the angular momentum is just the linear momentum multiplied by the radius of that orbit, we get this first relation where the angular momentum of an electron is its mass, m sub e is the mass of the electron, its mass multiplied by its velocity in that orbit, the nth orbit, multiplied by the radius of that orbit, the radius of the nth orbit. So if you take that quantization condition and then also kind of throw back to some classical stuff where we talk about the electric force on that electron due to the positively charged nucleus, okay. that would be the electric force it's in the nucleus, just a proton with charge equal to 1 E. So that would be the electric force. The centripetal force then needed in order to keep that electron going in a circle, in that circular orbit, we could write then as that its mass multiplied by its velocity squared divided by that radius. These are all well-established classical relationships. Then that electric force 
force, force says, oh, that's like the centripetal force that's keeping this electron here. So just set those things equal and then use that quantization condition of the angular momentum. You can use that angular momentum to sub out the velocity or the radius. It's pretty straightforward. When you do that, you get that the velocity is quantized, this discrete velocity now, is equal to this. And again, it's mostly just these constant values multiplied by 1 over n, the quantum number of that orbit. The radius, quantized radius, then again also has all these constant values, but it's multiplied by n squared, the square of the quantum number of that orbit. In fact, it's generally the case where you put all those variables or all those constants together into what's known as the Bohr radius. When n is equal to 1, that's the radius of the ground state of hydrogen. N equal to 1, that's the lowest energy state, the lowest angular momentum state, the ground state. So when n is equal to 1, the radius is just equal to all those constant values. We call that the Bohr radius, or A0. It's equal to 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11th meters. Or you could write it as 0.529 angstroms. An angstrom is 0.1 nanometers. It's a tenth of a nanometer. It turns out when you're talking about atoms, particles, uh, an angstrom is a fairly nice unit to use. Sort of like a, how a centimeter is related to a meter, and an angstrom to a nanometer. So if we put all, that, all those constants together into A0, then the radius, the quantized radius, looks very nice. It's just A0 multiplied by the quantum number squared. And remember those numbers, n, can take any value, 1, 2, 3, 4, it's a positive integer value. Okay, cool, so now we have equations for the velocity in any orbit, any quantum number, or the radius of that orbit, depends on n, the quantum number. So now we can think about the energy associated with any of these states. When n is equal to 1, what is the energy of that atom? Alright, well, energy in general is going to be the kinetic energy of an object plus its potential energy. So we're thinking about quantized states now, so this is the energy of the nth orbit. And these kinetic energy is going to be quantized, its potential energy is going to be quantized as well. And the potential energy we're thinking of here is the electric potential energy between the proton and the electron. And remember the proton has a charge E, positive E, the electron is charged negative E. So, the kinetic energy is going to be one half the mass of the electron times its velocity squared. But remember that velocity is quantized now. The potential energy, if you look back at the electric potential energy between two uh, charges, looks like 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, the two charges multiplied. That negative comes from the electron being negative. So each charge, E is that elementary charge. Proton is the positive E, electron is negative E. All over, uh, got ahead of myself, all over R squared. But again, we're talking about these quantized orbits, so R is quantized. If you take then that quantized velocity, the quantized radius, you're going to get for the kinetic energy, it turns out 30, 1 over 32 pi squared, epsilon naught squared, mass of the electron, charge of the electron to the fourth, over h bar squared, all that times 1 over n squared, right, the quantum number squared. We're going to have room here. So the potential, electric potential energy then, ends up looking like 1 over 16 pi squared, all this, only the number actually ends up being different, all the rest of this stuff. Nicely enough, it's the same, it's an E. Also multiplied by 1 over the quantum number squared. So these are like terms, we can just combine them. Then the total energy in the end turned out to be negative. Uh, that 32 pi squared, epsilon naught squared, squared, mass of the electron, electron charge fourth, 
h bar squared 1 over 2 over 1 over n squared. Again, most of this stuff is constants. It's really the 1 over n squared that is being, that is changing. So the, the book basically puts all this together, all this stuff together, calls it E0. I think that's maybe a little bit confusing. So I'm just going to show you, well, what is all that stuff put together? Say, just by calculating the energy of the first orbit. Okay. N equals 1. This is just going to be 1. Turns out if you put all those values in and write this in terms of electron volts, you get minus, minus 13.6 electron volts. This is the energy associated with the ground state of a hydrogen atom. If you put in n equals 2, right, it's just going to be this divided by 2 squared, divided by 4, minus 4, 0 electron volts. And you can keep doing this for these other electrons, uh, for these other orbits. And it's just going to keep getting greater. This uh, energy is just going to keep getting smaller. But again, remember, this is a negative energy. And just to be clear, right, we talked a lot about this in terms of the electron, but this is the energy of the atom. Because when we're thinking about the atom, we would think about it from, say, like its own reference frame, or another way of putting that is in the reference frame of the nucleus of that atom. So we're essentially stationary with respect to the nucleus, meaning that the nucleus has no kinetic energy. All the energy associated with that nucleus, we're thinking is only just the electromagnetic, electric potential energy, which is from the um, electric, electric potential difference between the electron and the proton. Right? And that's incorporated into our picture here. So it's that and the kinetic energy of the electron. That's the energy of the hydrogen atom in the ground state. The energy of any of these orbits for the hydrogen atom then is just the energy of the ground state, that minus 13.6 electron volts, divided by the square of the quantum number of these excited states. Right? So the n equals 3, the second excited state, its energy would just be minus 13.6 electron volts divided by 3 squared, divided by number. Or the fourth one divided by 16. Fifth one divided by 25. So if you plot those energies on a scale from like going below 0, the so 0 at the top, minus 13.6 is the furthest down you can go, for the greatest magnitude of energy that this atom will have, that's when the electron's in the ground state, plot that, and then these other energy levels are the first excited state, when n equals 2, second excited state, when n equals 3, third, fourth, fifth excited state, etc. Right? And since you're multiplying by 1 over n squared, all of these magnitudes of energy are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So if you think back to the emission spectrum then, there were these lines that were like spacing out further and further and further and that comes from the fact that you could have an electron in one of these excited states say from the n equals four the third excited state if that electron drops down to the ground state it's going to emit a photon with energy that's the difference between those states right? that's a pretty big difference and the electron the photon that comes out is going to have that energy versus if you go from, say, the first excited state, right, n equals 2, down to the ground state, the electron's going to drop down, emit a photon, the photon's going to have that energy. That energy, though, is less than this amount. So the energy of the photon that's coming out is just the size of these differences, these gaps. So from, say, like the n equals 4 to the ground state, maybe that was one of the bluish lines, versus from n equals 2 to the ground state, lower energy, longer wavelength, maybe that's one of the, more of the reddish line. All the transitions here are indicating emission, right, going from a higher state to a lower state, so you're letting energy out. The other way is also possible, if the arrow is going up, that would be like the electron absorbing a photon and then jumping up to a higher uh, orbit. In any of these states, though, say like the ground state, you could think of, well, how much energy does it take, or how energetic of a photon would you need in order to release that electron from the atom entirely? Or another way to put that is what does it take to ionize this hydrogen atom? 
So if you want to release this electron entirely, then essentially you just need to give it the full amount of energy to make it so that that atom's energy is now zero. You need to give it all this energy, and then it's basically released. And whatever energy was left over, or whatever energy above that amount, is going into the kinetic energy now, the electron that got released. That is to say that if I have an electron in the ground state of hydrogen, I need a photon of 13.6 electron volts to ionize that hydrogen, to release that electron. There's a lot of stuff going on here, but this has now given us a way of quantifying that emission spectrum, but it's based off of this physical model of a quantized hydrogen atom, right, where the electron can only be in these particular orbits and nowhere in between. All right, finally get to maybe another example. The example in the book, a little bit more than I think needs to be. I'm just gonna try to use some of these equations and get some numbers to go into there. So this is example 6.10-ish. So if a hydrogen atom is in the ground state, and it absorbs a photon that jumps the electron up to say, the fifth excited state. So like in our picture here, we're just showing maybe the ground state and the fifth state. We're not showing the four in between there. If that happens, what is the atom's new radius? Well, remember our quantized radius, we could write pretty simply in terms of the Bohr radius, which is the smallest radius in the hydrogen atom. So that A naught times N squared. And A, well, in terms of meters, it was this. And N, right, this is the fifth excited state. But remember, the ground state is 1. The first excited state is 2. So the fifth excited state is N equals 6. Essentially, excited state is the one less number. Okay, and then, well, just multiply these things. 19.4 times 10 to the minus 10 meters for uh, about 19 angstroms. Remember, an angstrom was a tenth of a nanometer. So that's the radius of the fifth excited state. Uh, how much energy then is needed to ionize this atom, to release the electron? Remember that the energy of this hydrogen atom is this negative value, and if I want to release the, the electron, I just need to give the electron enough energy to get up to zero. So really what's asking me, what is the energy of this bit excited state? That's going to be that minus 13.6 electron volts multiplied by one over the quantum number squared. Um, which was six. Turns out that's about 0.378 electron volts. Right? That's the energy of that state. Uh, sorry, minus, it's a negative value. The energy of that state below zero. So if I want a photon that's going to ionize this atom, the energy of that photon needs to be equal to that amount. The magnitude of that. Bohr's model is great. It explained the spectrum of hydrogen. It doesn't really work beyond hydrogen though, or hydrogen-like atoms. Basically, if you have any atom and you strip off all the electrons except for one, then they basically act like Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom. So it works great for that, and it's a model that tells us, you know, about the structure of the atom. Still didn't really get at why those orbits were quantized. Why could an electron only be in like this radius and then this radius? Why can't it be anywhere in between there? Or another way of saying that is why are those orbits quantized in, at all? At this point in the historical picture is where we get this guy whose name I also am terrible at pronouncing. I think most Americans say de Broglie, but I'm sure he's French and you definitely would not say it like de Broglie. It's more like de Broglie. Deploy? Deploy? So, good stuff. I'll just try to say Deploy. So that's where this guy Deploy comes along and basically has like a mic drop moment. I think he was a graduate student, this is how I understand it, and he was doing his PhD, and his thesis just basically said that, well, it's not just photons that are quantized, electrons are quantized, and neutrons are quantized, protons are quantized, all this stuff is quantized. It's like an Oprah thing, you get to be quantized, you get to be quantized. So, all matter is quantized. 
And in fact, it's quantized and it acts like waves in the way that photons are quantized, but they also can act like waves. And it was like a, I don't know, couple of page, maybe just like two page long thesis. It just submits it and it's like, there you go. I'm done. I'm out of here. He wasn't out there. He stuck around. He did more stuff. But it was a revolutionary idea that not just photons are these weird sort of things, but in fact everything at that scale acts in a similar way. It has wave-like properties, but it's also particle-like and it's quantized. So how does that help us? It helps us because if you think about an electron as having this wave-like property now, then it makes a lot more sense why these orbits are quantized. Well, if you start out with, say, um, thinking about waves on a string that's tied between these two ends, or like on a guitar. Right? If you pluck a guitar string, you can get standing waves, but there's restrictions, right? Those waves can only happen in certain ways because they're tied down to either end. For that situation, when you have a string that's tied down either end, you can only have multiples of half the wavelength fit into that uh, space. That's pretty much it. You're stuck with multiples of half wavelength. And De Broglie was basically saying that if you think about that standing wave and sort of bend it around, now we're talking about like, this is our circular string oscillating. If you bend that around, when the two points meet up, it's a slightly different condition, but it still only allows certain wavelengths to exist. It turns out that the condition for this circular pattern, where the two ends have to be at the same point, not just tied down, is that you can only fit multiples of a wavelength around this circle. The smallest one you can think of is like a wave starting at one point, it goes through a full wavelength and is ready to start over again by the time it gets back to that point. You have to have a full wavelength. Or you could have two wavelengths. But the key is, when it goes around the circle, you get back to the beginning of that oscillation and it starts over again. So in picture B here, we have sort of this like circular, or this bent standing wave. The circumference basically of this circle needs to be a multiple of the wavelength. If you take that idea then and wrap in the fact that energy is quantized, that E is equal to some multiple of HF, then you can rewrite that relationship, that energy quantization statement in terms of wavelength and momentum where wavelength was related to frequency by just standard wave relations. The energy is related to the momentum by that relativistic relationship. And so you're going to rewrite these things. If we then take our picture of these standing waves that are operating on this in this circular space, right? They have to meet back up so they can only be multiples of a wavelength, a full wavelength around this circle. That statement ends up looking like 2 pi times the radius has to be equal to some multiple of the wavelength. That radius is quantized as Rn, where n is however many multiples of the wavelengths we're talking about wrapping around. So take this wavelength momentum relationship, substitute in sort of quantized radius relationship just from the fact that these are standing waves on this circle, and you can then rewrite the momentum of this electron, this electron wave now in a sense, as n quantum number multiplied by h bar over the quantized radius. Then remembering again that the angular momentum for an object moving in a circle is very simple. It's just the radius of that circle multiplied by the linear momentum. So this is our momentum, right? Our radius, we said it had to be that R and that quantized radius. Substitute in our stuff for the momentum. Finally, we get that the angular momentum of electrons orbiting in this atom has to be equal to some multiple of h bar, n times h bar. Remember, h bar is just Planck's constant over 2 pi. And there you go. You basically get back out Bohr's postulate. So Bohr was just saying that angular momentum was quantized. That was, that's just the starting point. Right? That actually came out now of our change in understanding of electrons as acting like waves. And so not just electrons, remember, this is now going to apply to all kinds of matter, protons, neutrons, neutrinos, muons, in general, matter waves. This is an experiment that actually confirmed the fact that electrons act as waves. We're not going to go into the details very much, but it's basically you're producing a diffraction pattern from shooting electrons at a target. And remember, if you, if you get a diffraction pattern from something, that thing is acting like a wave. Another example, maybe a slightly easier example to uh, conceptualize, is if you think back, we talked about x-rays diffracting too. If you send 
uh, x-rays through a crystal structure, like crystal lattice structure, then the x-rays will bounce off the different lattice points and depending on the side, the spacing of the lattice, you'll get different path lengths for the x-rays that uh, scattered off those lattice points. The end being that you get diffraction patterns showing up on the other side of that material you're sending x-rays through. So you get a picture, the diffraction picture of x-rays going through material looks something like the left. If you do a similar sort of thing with electrons, you get the same kind of picture. Evidence that electrons are also diffracting as they go through a medium. And in case you weren't convinced, we can also go back to the good old double slit experiment. So if you recall, when we were looking at interference of light, the fact that light produced interference patterns was a dead giveaway that light was wavelength and it acted like a wave. It wasn't until later that we could do this experiment with electrons. We set up these slits, have an electron beam now, the fire sort of at these slits, have a screen on the other side where when electrons land, it you know produces some kind of visible indication. And guess what? When you do that, you get an interference pattern, just like you would with light. It's more condensed, the wavelength of electrons is much smaller than the visible light, but it's still an interference pattern. All right, maybe an example here. So if electrons do produce these interference patterns, we should be able to determine where the fringes, the bright fringes, now this is like an intensity or um, amount of electrons, a lot of electrons that are going to line up overall at these positions along the screen. In the example, it's kind of confusing. I think they're maybe excited that these slits are so tiny in the gold. The only thing we really need in order to think about the interference pattern that's going to be created from these electrons going through the double slit is the separation between the slits. All right, so we'll we're going to need this wavelength, right? So now everything's a wave essentially or has wavelength properties, so it has an associated wavelength. And we're also going to, to use that, we're going to need the momentum of these electrons. And if you recall, the momentum of the electron, or the momentum in general, can be related to the kinetic energy by the square of the the square of the momentum divided by twice the mass is equal to the kinetic energy of the object. Or that means our momentum looks like twice the mass multiplied by the kinetic energy and all that square root. Okay, so what is the kinetic energy of these electrons? Well, they're telling us that the electrons are being accelerated um, across a 600 volt potential. So we mean they're going through this space where overall the electric potential difference here is 600 volts. So the kinetic energy is just equal to the change in that electric potential energy. Where 600 volts, the potential difference, the charge involved is this electric charge. The electron trying to times that electric potential difference. It's like one, and this is where it's a little bit awkward, but you know, we're talking about one E, one charge of an electron, multiplied by 600 volts. And we can go into more detail of why this is the way it is, but pretty, in short, one electron charge times 600 volts is 600 electron volts. Turns out it's going to be a little bit helpful if we think about the rest energy of the electron for a second. This is actually 511 kilo electron volts, 1,000 electron volts, meaning that the mass of this electron we can write as 500 kilo electron volts divided by c squared. Okay, so put some of this stuff together, right? The wavelength of these electrons is going to be h divided by this momentum and the kinetic energy we know here. Now let's just write that simply first. Is that. Then I'll put some values in here. We're going to be end up writing this mass as electron volts divided by c squared. So that's meaning we want 
the electron volt version of H, which is that. This ends up being the square root of the mass, but I'm going to write that again as uh, 511 times 10 to the third, or kilo electron volts over C squared. And then that kinetic energy was 600 electron volts. And I don't want to rewrite all of this, but this um, factor of the speed of light squared, it's in this denominator here, it's squared and go all the way out, become just one over C, which could then go in the numerator. So it turns out that it's up there. Put all these different numbers in, end up with 0 0.05 nanometers for the wavelength of these electrons. Like I mentioned in a moment ago, this is a much smaller wavelength than visible light. Visible light was like 500 nanometers. Well, what then is the angle that the first um, interference maximum is going to be at? Go back to our interference pattern. Sine of theta is going to be equal to m lambda over d, but we're talking about the first maximum, so 1 times lambda over d. Lambda, we just found. Um, d is given 272 nanometers. This turns out to be 0 0.000184, meaning that the angle is 0 0.01 degrees. Very small angle, right? So the interference pattern is still there, it's just much more condensed now because the wavelength of these electrons is much smaller than the wavelength of visible light. So I don't think I mentioned this when we were talking about interference of light, because we hadn't really talked about photons yet, but it turns out that you can create an interference pattern with photons, or with light, visible light, if you only allow essentially one photon through the double slit setup at once. It's kind of a strange thing, but we'll talk more about that later, I think. For now, if we imagine we have this double slit setup, and we're shooting electrons through these double slits or through the apparatus, then you can sort of dial it down. It's kind of difficult actually. It wasn't until the second half of the 20th century that people were actually able to do this. But you can sort of dial down the intensity of the electron beam until one electron is traveling through the double slit apparatus at a time. If you do that, you might think, well, there's just one of these electrons going through at a time, so it's, it'll go through one of the slits, it'll go through the other slit, Intuitively, you might say that you would end up with just these two bands, okay, where electrons went through the top or which electrons went through the bottom. As it turns out, even going through one at a time, you will still build up this interference pattern. You get some of these dots and keep going, keep going, keep going. You get intense areas, right, where a lot of electrons are, and you also get kind of these dead zones, no electrons. Rather odd thing, maybe difficult thing to consider, but luckily enough, we have technology and people made some nice visualizations of this. Alright, cool. So we got double slit set up. We're gonna have a source. If the source is just particles, they're either gonna go through, they're not gonna go through. You end up getting these two just kind of scattered areas. You don't really get any kind of pattern to speak of. What if we have waves? Just thinking about waves going through this double slit setup. All the waves are, these wave fronts are propagating through. Remember, we have these Huygen wavelets, then they're created after that, and then we get this interference pattern on the other side. Now, think about sort of these particles that have these wave like properties. So they leave, they sort of travel as these waves, and then hit the screen. Travels these waves, even going one electron, say, through this apparatus at a time. It only hits as one electron when it gets there. It's still sort of feeling out this whole space. So that one by one, you still build up that interference pattern. So the first setup, particles. Second setup shown, waves. The third setup, something in between, or just something else entirely. One analogy that I was given a long time ago that stuck with me is 
this propagation is sort of like if you were at the edge of a pond or like a lake, and you take a rock, throw it into that pond, that rock is going to drop in, and then ripples are going to move out from where it dropped in, right? Eventually, those ripples are going to hit some shore elsewhere on the other side of the pond, say. If this rock acts like this quantum object, when those ripples hit the shore, at some point, the rock that you threw in just jumps back out, all the ripples cease, rock lands on the opposite shore. Very strange. So one way to analyze that picture is that these quantum objects, photons, electrons, protons, all this very, very small stuff, it acts in such a way where it kind of is emitted or it is absorbed in these chunks, but it propagates sort of like a wave. So it feels out this whole space. That's why in this double slit setup, even though it's just an electron leaving the source, an electron landing on the screen, it felt out, felt out as a weird, you know, anthropomorphizing it, but sort of feels out the whole space until it decides where it's going to land. And where it's going to land depends on that whole space. It depends on the fact there are these two slits, which is why you still get an interference pattern. This is kind of the last bit in this chapter, and I think we'll probably get to thinking more about what all this stuff means in the next chapter. But for now, you can kind of think about these quantum objects that are, you know, sort of particle-like, sort of wave-like. One way of visualizing that or thinking about that is in these wave packets, where you have a particle-like aspect because it's sort of confined in this space, but it also is a wave because it act, it's actually oscillating. There's a wavelength to it, some frequency to it. Um, it turns out that interpreting these entities, these matter waves, photons, wave packets, ends up coming down to thinking about probability. And that we'll definitely talk about in the next chapter. That's where we give rise to what you really call quantum mechanics. Just to mention that these entities also end up being governed by this principle, this Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And it's most commonly written in terms of the position and the momentum of an object. That is to say that you can never know exactly the position and the momentum of an object particularly a quantum object, but usually if we're talking about large-scale things, you think, you say in the position or the momentum, you're not really saying that exactly, actually. Right? You say my position is like, you know, 10 meters from that wall. In terms of quantum mechanics, you're like 30 orders of magnitude away from being precise. However, if you are talking about things that are very, very, very precise, those things can only be so small. Right? And if you know one better than the other one, gets worse. So the multiplication of these uh, measurements of position and momentum essentially has to be greater than h bar over 2. Remember, h bar is incredibly small, so that's why these position and momentum uncertainties don't come into play in normal life. This is only one form of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, but you can also write a time and energy uncertainty relationship. There's other ones you could write, but we can kind of visualize or think about this uncertainty if we think about this wave packet where the position or the uncertainty in its position, like where this wave packet is, is somewhere in between the left side and the right side, right, where the wave stops. Right? These, are the, these are the edges of this wave packet. So I know its position to this much. And then in this picture, the amplitude of this wave is kind of like its momentum. But the overall sort of wave packet, the energy there is just that, I mean, that's the energy. So what happens in this analogy is if I try to squish this wave packet down, if I try to nail down where this wave packet is or where this object is, then the amplitude shoots up and the momentum gets very, very large. If I spread this wave packet out, right, if I let my uncertainty in the position of this object get larger and larger and larger, the amplitude thing goes down, and I'm able to actually know the momentum of this object quite well. But I can't get both at the same time. And the very final thing, just brings us all the way back to the beginning, is an application of this new understanding of the objects in the very, very small scale acting like these quantum things where their energy is quantized, they're wave-like, even though they are also particle-like. One remarkable application of this information is electron microscopy. So the fact that electrons are wave-like means you can use that wave-like nature to get highly magnified pictures of tiny, these tiny little things, whatever 
specimen it is you're looking at. The wavelength of the electron is orders of magnitude smaller than the wavelength of visible light, meaning that the resolving power of these electron microscopes is far greater than any optical microscope can do. In fact, put some numbers to it, the resolving power of a transmission electron microscope is something like 0.05 nanometers, whereas the best optical microscopes is something like 100 nanometers, 2,000 times better than the best optical microscope. That then brings us all the way back to the beginning, where this is the kind of picture you can get of grains of pollen. That was a lot of stuff. I hope I made it understandable at some level. If not, you better have questions for me. Or I hope you have questions for me anyway. That's it though for chapter six. Chapter seven, I believe, is just about quantum mechanics, and so we're gonna get into the mathematics of quantum mechanics, and particularly, I think, the interpretation of these waves as having to do with the probability, or having to do with probabilistic outcomes. Till next time then.